we have traveled through our language stream um, looking at the original Hebrew word for our, our English word that appears as holy, holiness, sanctify, and sanctification. They are all the same essential Hebrew word. The only difference we're encountering is, as I just mentioned, the verbal conjugation of those verbs, which is slightly different than our English conjugation of verbs, and the, the adjective and the nominal, the noun form, of this word. Now, why on earth am I doing this? Because it's so darn taxing, right? Why am I doing this? Because I started this, and you'll keep hearing me repeat it until we get there. The book of Hebrews says, follow peace with all, not all men, with all. That means every individual and holiness without which no man will see God. That struck a chord with me that this subject, which actually runs from cover to cover of the book, has not been understood because if, if the case of understanding was simply that people were taking the word holiness to mean perfection, purity, or as I described on festival, morality or some ethical type of behavior, then what you have is only a small piece of what we're discussing because the reality is that in some cases, holiness, like holiness unto the Lord, when God says something is, it can in many cases signify purity, but not, and I've said this before, individuals do not stay as inanimate objects may stay as they're declared holy. People, individuals, move in and out It is, the best way to say this is maybe like transitory in this way, because we still have the ability to sin, and we still have the ability to make ourselves, if God says we are holy, we still have the ability to make ourselves, and forgive the terms here I'm using, but unholy, by virtue of, we'll call it this, the starting point is disconnecting from faith. That is what keeps me connected to God. The second thing is, the process in which this, we'll call it, making me, conforming me to his image and likeness is taking place. This is not, the subject is not about how to become pure or perfect. This lifetime will never have you be that. Somebody can be very moral. You can be a very moral individual. That simply means the ability to know right from wrong and to do right from wrong. If someone says that person is acting in a moral way or something that is ethical. But don't attach those concepts right off the bat, which is what most people do, morality and morals and ethics, and they want to attach it to this this group of words or this study, holy, holiness, sanctification, because, okay, in the big picture you could say, well, if God is speaking and God is giving a directive, If one opts to do the directive, that means obedience to to the Lord, and therefore you could say, well, that individual is moral in the sense of making the right decision, decision of choosing God, but it cannot be understood like that. That allows some movability in our Hebrew terms for which the terms moral or morality and ethics or ethical cannot be the primary definition. Why should this matter to you? Why does, why does this even matter to me? And I'm going to tell you why. I know what faith is. Does everybody here know what faith is? Yes, ma'am. Don't be embarrassed. I'm not having cameras put on you. Who does not know what faith is here in the sound of my voice? Raise your hand. Okay. Some, somebody might be embarrassed. That's okay. That's good. If somebody doesn't know, that's fine. I'm, this, is, this is a place where ego doesn't have any room here, there is no room for that, or being embarrassed because you don't know, this is not the place. You can save that for people that you might think, you don't want them to think that you don't know something. Here's a place where you come, and it's okay to not know what you don't know, because God's going to help you to know the things you need to know, that you have to know. So when we talk about faith, I can say, I have faith. The faith that I have is from the word, because we know that faith comes by hearing the word of God. We're not talking about faith, random, generic. We're talking about saving faith, the faith that is in Jesus Christ, 
that he indeed is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he indeed did come. And I'm just going to use me. I'm going to pretend, because each person has to do it for themselves. I'm going to pretend, and I'm going to just speak for me as if there's nobody here, just me and God. God, you did this thing for me. If no one else responded, that my eyes are open to no one to understand that I was born as a sinful creature, I am sinning in this flesh. It's the Adam container, we call it, the crock of clay. And that Jesus Christ came to reconcile me back to God so I could have communion. Sins are forgiven. The thing that was ruined in the garden, which is that perfect life, becomes reality of the beginning of a promise. For the New Testament tells me, in him, faith in him, brings me to life eternal. All I have to do is trust him. That's all. Now, with that being said, that's kind of the first layer, and people come into the church, and, well, what what do I got to do? And somebody will say, you just got to believe. No, 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 no. Because I could tell you just got to believe whatever. You know, you're going to fly a spaceship next year. Okay. (laughs) But if I said to you, you got to have faith, and faith has been defined here as, come on, do it with me, action based upon belief, sustained by confidence. Action that what God declared is true, is what he's declared it to be, that I can have the confidence that God is not a man to lie. People lie. God does not lie. I can take him at his word. And I can operate in the confidence that because he said and declared a set of facts, I can hang my entire being on the reality and the verity of what God has declared. Sin's forgiven. That means my guilty conscience, my mind which constantly vacillates back to the flesh is being, if I, if I keep in the faith, is being redirected again and again and again back to him. The big question that I asked last week, alluded to it probably, is what makes someone or something holy? When you're reading this book, what is it? What act or activity makes the object, or the person become holy. Well, let's start with the first and most obvious self-evident thing here, God. He's the one who has the sanctifying capacity. We do not. Never let anyone tell you. And I'm going to be, I'm just, in this subject, I'm going to be a little bit more dogmatic because I'm tired of the lunacy that I see or that I read when I hear people talking about holiness and suddenly it becomes Gee, if you're a Christian and you'd like to know what holiness is, you better stop living completely. I don't think so. I don't think God intended that. It's like the people who would say, and I'll get to it today or, or maybe next Sunday, the people that would say, well, if you look at the, the code that God set up, which some have labeled the holiness code out of Leviticus, you know, there's very strict laws that God put out pertaining to blood, the consumption of blood, the spilling of blood, of sexuality, the spilling of seed. I mean, there's a lot of very specific things. And you might, somebody reading this book, specifically Leviticus, might say, wow, this is about the most dry, boring, not very useful part of the Bible. That's what most people, by the way, there are sections that people skip over. Leviticus is one of them, and the genealogies. By the way, I think if you've, been listening for any amount of time, those are the places that I like to go to, (laughs) right? So I I made a few notes here on, I just mentioned the first one, holiness comes from God. Secondly, it is not a state that one can produce or manufacture, if we're talking about that which comes from God. And thirdly, a critical and careful reading, specifically of Exodus and Leviticus, where the bulk the most uh, concentration of the Hebrew word, kadesh, which is being translated holiness, holy, and sanctification, occur, will let us see that there are prescribed protocols and where the protocols are lacking to declare something or to make something become, we have to look elsewhere. That requires us almost taking the bird's eye view approach, which we've done here many times. So what's important here is to not skip over this book. And equally, 
what we might kind of glean out of this, as I said, it's a strange way to tackle this message, but we're going to do it from, again, a bird's eye so that we can get a feel for what we should be trying to understand. So if you want to turn to Leviticus, and I'm telling you in advance, if you are listening on radio, if you are a regular listener and you're listening on radio or tuned in on the Internet today, I will be reading from the NIV. Um, some, most of the time I like to read from the King James. I will be reading from the NIV for a purpose. The purpose is that all of my listening audience doesn't get hung up on certain words. The NIV has a more colloquial approach. So that's where we're going right now. And if you're following me, we're going to be going... I'm going to talk about the 16th chapter, but we're going to be in the 17th chapter of Leviticus. Now, while you're turning there, we have at least in the last few messages seen the importance of themes, clean and unclean, holy and unholy. And a person might say, why would you really kind of pick this apart? Because what you're looking at, it all depends on how you look at things. What you're looking at is a greater exposition of essentially of the law. What, what was revealed, and the law, by the way, is not just the Ten Commandments. The law is 316 do's and don'ts. So when somebody says, oh, the law, the law is not just the Ten Commandments in, in, in Exodus 20. But that being said, you've got, you've got detail out of Leviticus elaborating on some of those things that were said before. Now, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and kill a couple of sacred cows while we're at it. You know, there's going to be people, when I do this type of teaching, that will say, hey, she's teaching out of the Old Testament. She's teaching law. She's teaching this. Well, okay, first of all, I've got to dispel what the ignoramus is, okay? So just indulge me for a minute. There are 66 books designed for you and for me to read, to study, and to learn from. Some, the person, suck in your breath, the person that says, well, you don't need to teach the old because that's the law and we don't abide by the law. So let me ask you a question. The law says, or the Ten Commandments say, you are to honor your mother and father. So we could say, well, yes, the book of Galatians says the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that when Christ was come and faith was come, the law is no more. But here's where I get into, and these are the questions that ever so gently tap on what I'd call societal morals or ethics of society and understanding and relating in terms of general, not Christian, should we throw out the Ten Commandments that say honor your mother and father because Christ has come and the law has been fulfilled? Should we throw that out and say, well, you don't have to honor your mother and father anymore because Jesus fulfilled the law? Hmm. Silencio. Hmm. Is that, that like that question, can God make a rock that's so big that he can't move it, right? This is the same type of... And it's not silly to ask this. Now, let me take the reverse side of this. The person... Oh, I have somebody in mind, actually. So the person that constantly rants about... And they're, they're so unhappy about trying to glean out of Leviticus and out of Exodus, basically out of the Pentateuch, trying to glean something, their only retort will be, well, it's all about the law and it's all about the Old Testament. Well, if you do that, you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper because why? Part of that old declaration, don't settle it as a law of God. But imagine it this way, because the, the NIV will say it much clearer than the King James, and I'll read it to you in a minute. But imagine that God had to set all of these things out, laws for how to, hmm, how to determine what's clean and unclean, for example, how to determine how to offer certain sacrifices. No, how to offer all sacrifices. Why did God have to spell it out so specifically? He says so and explains why in the 17th and 18th chapters of Leviticus. There's a reason. He says, you are to, to do all of this because the people who were in the land before you, they defiled the land, and they did basically all the things I'm telling you not to do. They did. 
And essentially, God will say, and the land became defiled and vomited them out. I love that. There is a reason why God had to set all of this explanation, the perfect setup, but he had to explain it all. Because these people, and you can say whatever you want, failure to study this book is failure to understand the social context of the occurrence when this is going on. These people have no frame of reference. God must establish. It's like, you know, if if there's no speed signs posted on the street and there is no code, and you're all looking at me like, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no code for driving. It means that you can go out here, and instead of it being a 25 or a 35 zone, you know, do what you want. If you want to drive 110, we can fill it up faster over there. It's, there's a cemetery for those of you who are, who've never been to this building. There's a cemetery across the street. You can drive 110 on the street. I'm not telling you you can. Some, some person will say, Pastor Scott said you could drive 110 on Glendale, so I did. But you could, you could, if there was no law, you could go out there and do that, right? You could go out there and you could drive as slow as possible, which some people do, which is also, by the way, illegal. But um, the point is that there has to be a guideline to make sure that everybody knows the speed limit and it's posted. And if you drive a newer car, your car will probably say on your dashboard what the speed limit on the street is that you're driving. That's what the cars do now, so you don't have an excuse. If you get pulled over, you have to... uh, 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 (laughs) Don't look at my dashboard. I don't have one of those things in there. The point is, if there is nothing, then you could just do as you want. So take the frame of reference that as these children of Israel come out of Egypt's bondage, they don't necessarily have a full set of what one is to do. See, we tend to look at this part of the book, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as do, do, and don't do from our vantage point. But think of it as these people coming out of a land and even the most minute detail. God, sorry, this is what God says. These people ain't going to figure it out on their own. So I got to tell them everything. And that, that could translate into, um, let me be silly for a minute. Because I, I liken this section of, of Leviticus to this. Imagine if you came from a country that had never seen a toilet bowl before. You'd, n- you'd never seen it. You don't know what it is. And for all you know, it might be something that you put your belongings in. Because n- you've never seen that. So it makes perfect sense that if you were going to present someone with the special commode, right, that you would tell them, this is what it's for. This is what it does. This handle over here is the way you operate it. The lid, you'd have to explain everything, right? And there may be some things that might be self-evident, but the whole concept will not be captured if you've never seen a toilet before, let alone when you pull the little lever. Where does everything go? It's magic, right? Okay, so in this book, you got the same principle. God has to spell out every detail and not leave to chance, possibly, that people will do what they think they should do. This is why we've got all these instructions, including, and here's where I begin. Sorry for the long introduction, but here's where I begin. Leviticus 17 talks about the blood. And I, that's why I told you we'd be dealing with a subject which some people have a really difficult time with. And I'm not going to skip it because somebody has a tough time with it. I'm just telling you in advance. There's some really kind of brutal practices that happen here. And I'm going to read what they are. But before I do, let me just say this. You can't... What I'm doing right now is I want to focus on chapter 17 But chapter 17 has to do with the blood, eating the blood, properly disposing of the blood, or where the blood must go. And my focus will be on that. But you can barely jump right into 17 because chapter 16 is on the Day of Atonement. 
which has to do with the shedding of blood to make an atonement for the people and for their sins. So I, I want to make it clear that I'm, I'm jumping in in a very awkward place, but if you were reading this book in its proper divisions, you essentially won't find more than about four divisions for the whole book because they have to either do with the laws of offerings and the five offerings to God and the way of approach to God and what God deems acceptable. I mean, think about the detail. God has to go right down to if you're poor and if you can't afford, this is what you do. And if you live uh, in a certain part, this is what you have to do. And depending on your gender, this is what you have to do. And this is what is expected of you. Now, indulge me with this for a second. And I want you to look at this book instead of looking at it and saying, wow, that's the law. I want you to look at it and say, for the time that it was given, it was the revealed will of God. For the time that it was given, it was God saying, this is the way I want you to do everything. And everything will be subject to change once the tabernacle becomes a thing of the past and the temple is erected in Solomon's time. And then once again, things will change completely. Don't think they change at the coming of Christ, though, because while when Christ came, people were still offering and doing the rituals of the temple. So it's important for us to look at this and not say it's the law. And one more thing I have to talk about before I read chapter 17. This book is largely, well, there's, there's chapters in here that have to do with um, relations, people's cleanliness, or their ritual and cleanliness for women, however you want to deal with that. But the interesting thing about this book is it deals largely, there are two really big subjects that are being dealt with. One of them, the largest one, has to do with offering and giving. The second one has to do with what we're going to call God's way of deciding what is acceptable in his eyes. That brings us into the conformity of what God says is clean, unclean, holy, unholy, based on the prescription or the way of approach to God. So there will be people that will say, giving, for example. In your own time, please read this book, and maybe, maybe we'll find that we're all reading the same book eventually, because the book basically says plain and very clear the bulk of these are offerings, sacrifices and offerings to God, which God says these offerings, these sacrifices are holy. They are holy to be in contradistinction to offerings that may be made to pagan gods for which we should not forget that Israel had a tendency to lean and slip into every type of other religion with other gods, which is what will be chronicled about the, the land of Canaan and the people that lived in that land before the children of Israel got there. That basically says, they're God saying, I expect certain things. I expect you to offer in a certain way. Don't ever... And, you know, there's a couple of folks out there that like to weekly take on things that I say. I don't look. I'm, I don't even, quite frankly, people will just give me reports of things. And I think to myself, now that's a poor fool out there that would say, God does not expect you or me to give, ever. When that book, Leviticus, has more to do with giving and offering. Where does God start in the book? He starts with the burnt offering. The burnt offering is an offering of which no portion remains with you. It's completely offered up to God. It's a burnt offering, wholly offered up to him. You could say, well, that's a waste, but it's wholly offered to him. There isn't any part of that that we can take a claim of. Now, there will be people that will say, well, we don't, we don't give like that. We don't do that. Well, just like the example that I gave out of saying, the law says, by the way, honor your mother and father. Just because honor your mother and father is in the law, 
and we say the law has been fulfilled by Christ, should you not honor your mother and father? I know there's, there's that big crazy divide of people out there that will go absolutely insane if they can read it in the first half of the book and say, oh, but that's there, so I don't have to do that anymore. So basically, maybe, maybe it is true. Maybe that's what's, what's wrong with this generation. There is no honoring mother and father anymore because we do what's right in our own eyes, which, by the way, is the definition of, our, of sin, doing what's right in your own eyes. But I don't know why someone would consider that a mandate of law when it's God's way of saying, you have no frame of reference. Unlike the pagans that do, God is saying, my children, the children of Israel, I want them to relate to me a certain way that is not common, that is not, I will not, God will not be homogenized with other pagan gods. God's offerings will not be homogenized like other pagan offerings. And if you don't think that there was a system of sacerdotal offerings amongst the pagan communities and the cultic rituals, you're insane, you're a lunatic. Go read history. History tells me that votive cultic offerings were an integral part of society. So God had to spell out that if you're going to offer something to me, you're going to offer it this way, and you're going to prepare it this way. For if the offering is to represent blood poured out, which represents the life, which is a life poured out, It must be done, he says, the instructions in Leviticus must be done. Don't do it out in the field. Bring your sacrifice to the door. The person who takes their sacrifice and decides they can do it out in the field, that person's lot is death for them. That's what the Bible says. So what exactly do you do with people like Gideon and Manoah and other folks who had to offer, but they didn't make it to the tabernacle. Did God smite him? Did God kill him? No. That tells you that God knows he set boundaries for certain things and also gave a little bit of fudge room because he knew that it was impossible. Some people, and that's what you'll see in this chapter I'm about to read, he's going to say if anybody does this, then, then their fate is sealed. Well, God, that's what I'm saying to you is don't read this and then make it into a checkbox because God knows just like as we move into the New Testament, God knows our frame. There will be no more bring a lamb, bring a goat, bring a ram. Why? Because we had one lamb that was offered for the sin of the world. No longer necessary. Now, Leviticus. And I said, no, I know I have a mature audience, but when we talk about some of these subjects, people can be a little bit unfamiliar because they don't spend much time reading, so there'll be a lot of goriness to the details here. And I'm reading from NIV. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron and his sons and all and to all the Israelites and say to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Any Israelite who sacrifices a cow a lamb or a goat in the camp or outside of it, instead of bringing it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, that man shall be considered guilty of bloodshed. So God was saying, no, it's not enough for you to just go and sacrifice something. Now, I need to put, everybody put the thought process here, press the pause button for just a second. Pause. Everything I've said, just press pause. In this respect, when it says anyone who sacrifices, doesn't that mean the putting to death of, the sacrifice here doesn't mean you're putting something forward. It, it is a laying down of a life. So remember last week when I said the root of sacred and sacrifice, when we trace them back, they actually have to hold two different directions. Why? Because sacred will come to us from the Latin for sacer, which we get our words, which are improperly translated holiness. But the things that are sacrificed, those are things that must die. You can right away see there that the use of the word brings two distinct actions, which which coming from two words that look a lot alike, but they're functioning in a different way. So the sacrifice must be made at the tent door. This is what God is saying. And if the individual does not bring it to the tent door, they will be guilty of bloodshed. He has shed blood and must be cut off from his people. 
So God's not messing around here. He's, he's, he's not saying generically, yeah, kind of, and that'll do. He says, this is specifically what I want you to do. Follow me with this. I tell you something, and I say, this is what I really would like. You know, you ever ask somebody, what would you really like to eat? Oh, I'd love to eat pizza, right? Well, if you asked, if you took the time to ask me what I'd really like, and I tell you, don't go and bring me uh, something else. If you asked me, and you took the time to ask me what it is that will give me pleasure and that I desire, I said, I want that. That's what God is saying. God's saying, don't bring me something else. I asked you to bring me this. And he goes, God's pretty persnickety. Well, God says, I want you to do it this way, and there's a reason for it. And it's not because I'm so uh, on top of the world, although I am, but because I said so. And I don't really have to give you a reason because I said so. You either do it or you die. (laughs) Motivational services offered freely by God. All right. This is so the Israelites will bring to the Lord the sacrifices they are now making in the open fields. So you see, God gave a prescription for something, and they were still doing it the wrong way. They must bring them to the priest, that is, to the Lord, at the entrance of the tent of meeting and sacrifice them as fellowship offerings. The priest is to sprinkle the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. Now we're having another term that's being brought in that will be a term that will go straight through the Bible. When we think of prostitution, we think of illicit, uh, illicit sexual uh, favors in exchange for money or other things. God looks at the infidelity or the lack of following what God says, and he says, this is prostitution. Be clear on the terms as well, because a lot of times we read them, especially from the King James Version, we get a little confused on what exactly God's saying. This one's pretty clear. He says, anything else essentially is like whorish behavior, and I won't, I won't tolerate it. That's what I love about God. You, know, the, you could say, well, this is a little bit vague. No, it's, it's not, not at all. But we're going somewhere with this. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them and for the generations to come. Say to them, any Israelite or any alien living among them who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to sacrifice it to the Lord, that man must be cut off from his people. Any Israelite or any alien living among them who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from his people. For the life of the creature or a creature, is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. Remember, the chapter that came before was about the Day of Atonement and the reason for offering the sacrifices that the priest did on the atonement, on the Day of Atonement, which is why I said it's hard to just jump in in chapter 17, because I'm right in the middle of something. Right? We're, talk- we're still talking about the blood. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any alien living among you eat blood. Any Israelite or any alien living among you who hunts any animal or bird that may be eaten must drain out the blood and cover it with earth because the life of every creature is in its blood. That is why I have said to the Israelites, you must not eat the blood of any creature because the life of every creature is its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. Just a few verses more. Anyone, whether native-born or alien, who eats anything found dead or torn by wild animals must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean until evening. Then he will be clean. And if he does, if he does not wash his clothes and bathe himself, he will be held responsible. Yes, and he will also be stinky. So that was added by me. All right. So what, what I want to show here, though, and this is, This is one part of understanding when we talk about when God says a thing. In this case, the instructions are being given. This is the way of approach. This is, remember, I said to you, Leviticus uh, opens with the offerings acceptable to God, starting with the burnt offering and taking you through all the offerings and all the specific set times and offerings. So once you get to this 17th chapter, you have already gone by 
we'll call it the, the understanding, the, the orders that God is giving become when people are carrying out the sacrifice, the proper sacrifice, and doing it God's way, they're acting in obedience to God's word. We may translate that in the New Testament and say acting by faith, obediently running to the one who is declaring such a thing. But the bird's eye view, because that's what I described it as, is God saying, I'm asking for you to do this, 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 a set way. It's expected of you, you call yourself the children of Israel, it's expected of you to do these things. Now, in the 18th chapter, it's spelt out really clear because he says to him, and this, the 18th chapter has all, everything to do with sexual relations, and you'll read probably, let's see here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think there's at least 14 or 15 do not, do not do this, do not do that, and it all has to do with sexual relations and the proper or appropriate. And you might say to me, well, isn't the 18th chapter, doesn't that carry some uh, moral instruction, instruction to it? Well, we may say that's the ability to know what's right or wrong, and if you read that, read that in your, that chapter in your own time to see that, to me, it would appear to be self-evident that there are certain behavioral things that God says are not right, that even if they weren't declared there, you would say, and if you, had, if you didn't have this book, you'd say it's still not right. All right? This, as I said, goes on to deal with not having sexual relations with children with their parents or with siblings or with animals. I mean, it's, it's, it's got the whole list of things that says, God says, this is displeasing to me. But if you read through the whole chapter, and by verse 24 of the 18th chapter, God says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways. Because he's just spent 23 or 24 verses telling them about how to keep themselves or be appropriate in their relations between men and women. And I'm sorry, there are no, there are no instructions for men and men and women and women. He, he says he detests that. God speaking from his book. I didn't say that. That's God's word. What is very clear, he says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. So God's saying, see, if you read this properly, you're not going to see this as a rule book. You're going to see this as God saying, hey, all the pagans out there, every culture out there, this is what they deem socially acceptable. Go back and reread it in your own time, all of the diverse sexual activities that he says, this is what the pagans do. I will not accept this. The same way, if you're reading with the same mindset, pagans may have offered, and they did offer offerings, and they were blood offerings. Many were grain, but most were blood, including sacrificing their children to Moloch. Children, their own children, sacrificing them to Moloch. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is here we begin to see in Leviticus, as I said, bird's eye view of what God is calling common versus what God is calling holy. And if you're reading it the, the way I've just described, which is don't read it like a law book with a whole bunch of rules, read it with the mindset that God had to tell these people the activity of those people who are in the land that I'm about to drive out their behavior is common. Their practices are common. Their practices and offerings are unholy and unclean and not given to strictly to the deity. They have multiple purposes. They have multiple deities. But God repeatedly in this book keeps saying, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Why does he have to keep telling the people, I am the Lord, except he wants them to know he is not to be homogenized or his offerings or his people with that that he's referring to in juxtaposi juxtaposition to that which is common, profane, pagan, and not of God. Now, once you start reading the book that way and understanding holiness and sanctification that way, you get a little bit better idea of what holiness is not. 
And this is why I'm kind of excited, because it brings you into the realm of being able to study this book, read all of Leviticus, and you're going to see something pretty important. When God describes the offerings, and he says in certain verses, he'll say, and it is most holy unto the Lord. Another place he'll say, this day or this festival or this feast time is holy unto the Lord. Exclusively and distinct as opposed to everything else that's going on. Because we read this book and we've got like, a, it'd be like saying, we're reading this and the analogy of these people is like us thinking that everybody here in this room, you are all the people of the earth and there are no other people out. This is how we, we, this is how we read the Bible. Like, it's only us here and there are no other wanderers, no other But clearly the Bible tells me and tells you that when they entered the land, when they finally entered the land, God said, I'm telling you what to do. Go wipe the people out. I told you what to do. I'm not going to hand you the land. You go take it. And yeah, there's people in the land that you've got to get out of here, right? Well, the point is that if you're taking the whole book like that, Leviticus specifically, but you can do Exodus and Leviticus the same way, You're not reading to study. You're not reading this book and trying to analyze the legal instructions. You're trying to see that God was trying to make these people separate and distinct from these people and their conduct, what they ate, how they prepared certain things in their worship practices to make it as clearly distinct from everything else which is common, profane, worldly, and pagan. When you start to read the book that way, man, it changes everything. So I'm not looking for people to say, well, you know, the law, the law, the law. I'm looking for you to study an understanding of why God was so specific that it sheds light on the idea and concept of what holiness and sanctification actually mean. Now, in the Old Testament, all they could do is carry out the prescribed offering. The priest could carry out the way into the most holy. And as long as he carried out every single part of the instruction, let's talk about the Day of Atonement. As long as he carried out all the instructions, they would hear the bells ringing on the bottom of his robe because he did everything as it was prescribed to be done. And he would live and come out and emerge, and the people would celebrate and rejoice because for another year, their sins were, at least for this particular celebration, or somber uh, celebration, their sins were covered. Now, I'm asking this question because it really is at the root of understanding our word study. Does the concept of holiness or sanctification now bring you into the realm of reading this book and its instructions as be perfect. Okay, that was about 10 of you, which makes me happy because that's 10 more than we had last week. Right? See, it's always a positive spin on everything. Could you read this book and say, this is something, holiness, is something that you yourself are able to do to stand in God's presence. You do it to be holy. The answer is no. You can be obedient to God, and you can have faith in what he says. But the holiness, that that thing that God says, that is because I've declared it, is a separation. Now, remember, we're defining terms, and every week we're defining them maybe in a different dimension or maybe a little bit deeper. But the whole idea of what I've done today is to say, if you read through, and in your own time, I ask you two things. Please reread. If you have time, reread Leviticus in its entirety. If you don't have time, read 17 and 18, because you will see, and especially as you get into chapter 18, which has all these forbidden sexual practices. It's not that God is a pervert or that God's some, you know, he's a sex bird or something. God says, hey, these are the things that I, I, I have deemed inappropriate. These are the things that if we're looking to, now we're going to look from the Old Testament all the way into the New. One of the reasons why, I'm going to pretend I'm, I'm speaking for God right now. One of the reasons why I don't want you having sex with those other people and producing children, it will produce a mixed seed. And if you read carefully, you'll find that God is saying, 
I don't want a mixed seed. I want this seed to be a seed that descends. Oh, the devil tried to thwart that. Believe me, every place that you look, when you read the genealogies, I just mentioned it. People would say, oh, you don't need a genealogy. You know, just throw the damn genealogies out because they don't serve anything. It's just a bunch. It's a chronicle. That's what they did. No, my friends, the chronicle is to show us that all walks of life are in the family tree that lead to the Lord Jesus Christ, that God had a set time, that even the instructions, you might, you might think sexual practices and all the things that are here, does that lead me to Christ? Somewhere it does. And God is not saying, and he has never said, there were rules prescribed for the, for the priest for their cleanliness or when they were about to tend in the tent. But God never said the things that we have now enjoined to the church today, which is a holy, I'm just going to say it, a holy man, or sometimes referred to as a man of the cloth. What makes a person holy? Is it because they're wearing a special suit with a collar? Is that what makes you holy? Because if that's what makes you holy, well, we'll all wear suits. (laughs) Hear the expression, the clothes don't make the man? Well, the clothes don't make the man holy. They don't make the woman holy. But what we, what we do know is God says, this is the way I want it done. And I'm not really wanting to explain to you that I want it done this way, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I'm a good, kind, and generous God to give you the information to let you know that my people, the ones I've chosen, I've chosen to set them apart this way. And once they are performing the thing I've asked them to do, which is set apart this way, no one is ever going to confuse them with those other people out there. This Clarity tells me God was very particular in revealing what was important to him. Trying to preserve something that was lost in the garden, which as you kind of watch the the Old Testament unfold and we head towards the New, you realize something. There will be many times over where God is prescribing something for the people a way, a path, uh, whatever it is that's described, that actually it could change and it may change. And actually, when you read it, the Bible, it does change. The fact is that when God is saying something, it is listening to his word that brings me into, okay, now I'm listening to God. And it's not enough to say, okay, I heard it, but I'm just going to go and do what's right in my own eyes. No, I heard what God is saying. And for the New Testament believer... I become set apart back to Ephesians, chosen out from among those who weren't chosen. The Greek word is exolexito, for himself, for his pleasure, for his good pleasure. That that process that I, I, I cannot manipulate, I cannot change, but when it does occur, I also have the choice to take God's word and begin to obey, begin to study, begin to read, not in legalism, but by faith, and by virtue of that, because I am trusting and I'm faithing in God's word, I'm a saint. I'm not a saint because I'm perfect. I'm not a saint because I've engaged in ritual cleansing. Jesus said, and I'll repeat it again, he said to his disciples, you are made clean through the word. The word is true. And elsewhere, that's John 15 and John 17, where then he, in his high priestly prayer, says, sanctify them, Father, sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify them in thy truth. No more the need for, we had the spilling of blood of the one that was sufficient once and for all, but no longer the need to go through these exercises in, we'll call it sacrifice and bloodletting and everything else that was part of the Old Testament, but rather now the operation is by faith, which is why I cannot understand why anyone would preach a doctrine and confuse people into telling them that if you'll just act a little bit better and if you'll just change what you do, that's not going to bring you into the realm of being a saint. That's not going to bring you any closer to God. Because I know a lot of people, and I can tell you I've known a lot of people who love the Lord, but they are son of a guns, okay? And that's God's business, not mine. God's in the middle of changing people. Sometimes he changes them and scales fall from your eyes and you see things quickly. And other times it's over 
the course of years that you finally realize, hey, God actually called me and wants me, and I'm, I'm part of this group of people he calls his. And let's just add to this so I can bring this all to a close. I don't have a method that will bring somebody into the state of being holy. What I have is a book that says God laid out a whole bunch of things that are important to him, that he said do this way until the coming of Christ. Don't discount the essence of what's being said. I'm not taking you back to the law and saying do the law, study the law, perform the law. I'm telling you, look at it and glean from it from a different perspective and you will see that the whole while while God's laying down a law that he knows no man can keep, He also knows that if he didn't lay down a law, there would be abundantly probably the whole camp. Well, they did. They did what was right in their own eyes when when they said, Moses is taking too long up on the mount. We want something we can worship now. Give us the golden calf. Okay, Aaron, give me your gold. Give me me all your earrings. Take the earrings out of your nose. Take them out of you wherever they are. Take them out. Come on, put them in the pot. We're going to melt them down. Put them in the fire. We're going to make a golden calf. Oh, Moses Moses isn't here. We don't care. We got something to worship. You know why that pissed God off? Not because, well, they were disobedient. But here they are now offering their worship to an idol. And once more I come back to what set these people apart from other people. The other people worshipped idols. This is why God says in his word, I'm a jealous God. There will be no gods before me. I'm Essentially, I'm it. And if you don't want to worship me, God is speaking. If you don't want to worship me, you ain't going to worship at my feet. You don't want to do it my way? That was God's way of saying, this isn't some pagan homogenization. Now, why is this so relevant today? You might say, well, is this kind of archaic? Is it? No, it's extremely relevant. It's so relevant that I think if I really think about this, this book, including Books like 1 Peter, as I said last time when I taught through 1 Peter, extremely relevant. Why? Because what has the world done today? What has the church world done today? They have taken all of the practices that go on in the world that everybody likes, and they've brought them into the church, and they've made it part of the church and part of worship. But I can't find it anywhere in that book. I can't find anywhere that God said he wants it done that way, old or new. Go back to the Old Testament and you see this is why it's just as appropriate to teach on this today as it was in the day that it was decreed by God's word through the pen of Moses. Because people are still trying to take the world and bring it in and not be separate. Separate is not, as I said, you know, wear a dress, don't wear any makeup, don't smoke, don't drink, don't cuss, don't breathe, don't even look but rather what I've just described. And something tells me anybody preaching perfection, you can be perfect, hasn't even understood the heart of God. Because God's saying, you know, we study the law, the rabbis have picked apart the law, written commentaries, the Mishnah. You remember I brought you a book a couple of years ago, Lech Lecha, and it's a commentary on the rabbinic, midrashic, Talmudic, everything that you could think of that's a commentary on something, which is mm, talking about discussions about minute things that have no relevance instead of looking at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is step away, and you'll see what God is saying. He laid all this information out to say, you are separate and distinct. Your worship practices will look like this, not because, I think in this case, he had to regulate them, but to keep them distinct from those worship practices that were going on so nothing became homogenized. In our modern day and age, what almost killed the church, probably, I mean, several times, but certainly in our modern history, what almost killed the church was the holiness movement, another movement that came in through, unfortunately, through the Assemblies of God, which is the oneness movement, but all of these movements that come in that are people taking a portion, a portion of scripture and making it out of context and trying to make, force you to do it instead of looking at it the way I just did. And the, when you analyze it this way, you think, yeah, God had to spell it out because even when he spelt it out, the people still didn't get it. But he wasn't, I don't think he was spelling it out like saying now, I'm, I'm going to have this thing here 
so that you can check a box so much so as that we looking back now can see God was saying, this is the way I want the worship done. This is the way I want the priest to perform. This is so that it's not homogenized with everything else that's common. This is holiness unto the Lord. We'll keep going on this, but I'm asking you to do a little bit of homework, and that is go and read Leviticus 17 and 18 in your own time, and if, you, if it makes you feel better to do it in another translation that you can just read through it in the colloquial tongue, do so so that you can see what I'm pointing out. And the wonder of this is it changes how you will ever approach the words. We're, this, we're not finished. We're just getting started. But for today, it will at least give you clarity. We are not dealing with God saying, you perform, and you perform perfectly. Why? Because he knew no one could keep the law. But what he was saying is, I want you to know what I want. And when I've asked for something, it's not because I'm some uh, prima donna God sitting up in heaven saying, you will and you will not, but rather because I know that you don't know. God speaking to the children of Israel. I know that you don't know the way. And I loved you enough without even saying this to you, sent you a deliverer to bring you out of Egypt and to bring you into a land that I promised to Abraham four generations earlier, or three and a half, whatever it is. But obviously, you don't know me and my way, so I'm going to spell it out for you. Now, once you have seen my ways, maybe it'll become clear to you that this is what I actually want. God asked for the children of Israel to be faithful, and I, I can honestly say reading the book, they weren't. Just that one simple thing that wasn't even about bringing an animal or do, just trust me, they couldn't. When it says that very few people entered into the land, we know God was just wanting one thing, actually. You know what? He wasn't wanting the people to keep and perform and to jump through hoops. He was wanting to see obedience to his word. Guess what? God has not changed one iota because he still wants the same thing. He doesn't want us to perform in, in legalism or in perfection, but he wants us to operate by faith and take him at his word. That's all he's asking of us. I'm asking you to read his word, study it, and next week we'll come back and pick apart more instructions for holiness from God's book. But right now, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.